Bonjour. Annie, good morning. My intention this morning is to make the case that indigenous philosophies and epistemology should matter to digital rhetoric. And they should matter not merely in a, well, I should cite a brown person so I look properly progressive kind of way, but instead in an embodied, fully acknowledged kind of way. Not in a relegated to the corners of our conferences, to competing other caucuses, to a march the brown scholars across the stage while the white folk applaud themselves for their inclusivity kind of way, but in an always already part of the conversation kind of way. I'm here to argue that when we define digital rhetoric, what it is, what it can do, what it can be, what it can allow, and how we find, position, understand ourselves in relation to it, there is much to be learned from those who came before, from those whose land our universities sit upon, from those who may or may not have access to our systems and institutions of knowledge making, but have deeply rooted historical philosophical systems for being in the world, composing objects in the world, and relating to those objects and the underlying systems central to our meaning making practices. So to those ends today, I'm gonna to bring together here some basic American Indian philosophy, along with the Ojibwa concept of Ayan Guamazin, a reconsideration of Scott Lyon's understanding of rhetorical sovereignty, and a few stories of Ojibwa women's making and gathering practices. And these stories are serving largely as my theoretical underpinning. In this bringing together, I hope to illustrate why, beyond the simple ethical fact that leaving out entire other ways of knowing and being isn't a sound methodology or epistemology for scholarly work, cultural rhetoric, in this case indigenous rhetoric, has a lot to offer digital rhetorical theory and practice. So I'm gonna narrow my talk today to one specific area of digital rhetoric in one specific context. That is the gathering of assets a rhetor often compiles when composing a digital text. While not all digital texts are multimodal, when composing digitally, we often compose through assemblage, through a gathering together of pre-existing rhetorical assets. However, the space of digital composing has the potential to make more visible this gathering practice, which may, we could argue we're doing in print in some ways too. But this collection of images, sounds, words, and designs that go into its text and the active set of connections between those assets and their pre-existing relations. And I've been excited at this conference to hear um, both Byron Hawk and Liz Lash talk about material conditions that are going into rhetorical situations. So Byron with all the sound cables and the elements that actually go into the making. Liz talking about Lanham's um, drapes <laughs> and carpeting, because in a way that's kind of what I'm tapping on today. So when engaging, embracing, embodying a digital rhetoric, we gather, we collect, we make new. And in doing so, I hope we respect the relations that came before, while mindfully honoring the assemblages and possibilities brought forth. A story. It's a clear, cold October day in Upper Michigan, and my mother has been tasked by the American Indian Student Group, of which she is an advisor, with gathering cedar boughs for the weekend powwow. I ask if I can tag along, as this seems like a good chance to catch up, and for me to learn a little bit more about my Anishinaabe heritage, which I've been mostly avoiding. We park alongside a rural highway outside of Lakeland in Michigan between Lake Superior and Torch Lake and tromp into a thicket of white pines, maples, and cedar trees. My mom is carrying a knife. I'm carrying a wicker clothes basket. I don't really ask her what she's doing as she leads me through the forest, fallen leaves crunching underfoot, the north wind whipping off Lake Superior, rustling the branches overhead. Mom is clearly scoping out the trees, but I'm not entirely sure what for. She examines them from different angles, grabs their boughs with her hand, feeling their soft lace-like texture, and eventually settles on a branch to harvest. She takes her knife, carefully cuts off a two-foot-long branch, and drops it into my basket. The task is repeated until the basket is full. At this point, she curses, realizing she forgot the tobacco, so she can't give a proper thanks to the trees for what they've given us. She looks up, gets quiet for a bit, and we head back to the car with our basket full of cedar. Back at home later that day, it occurs to me I missed a potential learning moment. So I asked my mom what exactly this sussing out of the branches was about. She explains how she was looking both for healthy trees, ones that wouldn't be harmed by her taking of a branch or two, and also looking for a shapely branch, one that would look aesthetically pleasing when placed in a bundle and hung from the entrances of the powwow circle, which is what these branches were being gathered for. <laughs> 
She used the knife instead of just tearing off the branch so as to respect the tree's life, to do as little harm to the tree as possible. And in the spirit of doing no harm, she also gathered from as many different trees as possible. And at the end of it, she should have, would have, offered tobacco to honor the trees and the Gitche Manitou, but sometimes good intentions are enough. In considering gathering as an active part of a digital rhetorical practice, I'm making some nods here to assemblage, assemblage theory, but for the sake of this paper, I'm not really going deeply into it at all, although you might hear resonances. Um, you can also read about shameless self-promotion. My brother and my thoughts on connections between Deleuze and American Indian philosophy um, in a collection that actually Kathy Yancey and Stephen McElroy are working on right now. But what I do want to call attention to here is the way that rhetoric and composition have taken up this term, particularly through the lens of um, John Dan Johnson Alala and Stuart Selber, who um, make the definition, assemblages are texts built primarily and explicitly from existing texts in order to solve a writing or communication problem in a new context. When seen through the lens of an indigenous gathering practice, Alala and Selber's definition only works for me insofar as we understand text as active entities, inherently relational in nature, and as we understand the responsiveness of the assemblage as one that is innovative and productive, not relying on a reuse that presumes objects have fixed essences. But what objects do have when understood through indigenous thought isn't always already relationality. For as my brother and I have argued, the world is not full of concepts just waiting to be plucked from their context. And this is a point I hope some folks would see connections, intersections, interventions between some of tour, some triple O work. I'm not making those connections, but I hope you might see them and talk to me later about them. So consider my mom's gathering of the cedar and how in doing so she honors both the spirit of the tree and the spirit of all things. She honors, or would have if she remembered the tobacco, the tree's spirit, which in Ojibwa is Manito, and the Kichi Manito, which is in its simplest form translated from Ojibwa into the great spirit. But that understanding of the great spirit um, is, as both Viola Cordova and Basil Johnston argue, really trapped in an ontotheological narrative of just assuming there's this one great spirit. Um, Basil Johnston instead offers up this definition of the way Ojibwe understand spirit, saying, Manitou refers to realities other than the physical ones of rock, fire, water, air, wood, and flesh, to the unseen realities of individual beings and places and events that are beyond human understanding, but are still clearly real. Gitche Manitou then may be understood in part as the great mystery, the unknowable thing, connection, space, air, energy that runs through it all. In honoring the Manitou of the tree, the gatherer acknowledges that the object did not necessarily exist solely for the gatherer's gathering. The cedar has other relations not directly observable to us. But in this particular articulation of the cedar and my mom, it is her responsibility to honor her harvest and the ways in which she inserted herself into that particular ecology at that particular moment for that particular reason. There is here in this indigenous gathering practice, one not just enacted by my mother, if that weren't clear, a careful consideration of the thingness of things. That things, whether that thing be a video clip, some deer hide, a James Brown drum track, a cedar branch, don't exist solely for our repurposing, even though we might choose to repurpose them. Things have relations without us, which isn't news to a lot of folks doing object-oriented work or indigenous folks. And if you ask, told an indigenous um, person who kind of practices traditional uh, ways of being what object-oriented folks are up to, I think they'd say no shit. Um, <laughs> anthropologist J. Irving Hollowell recounts a conversation with an old Ojibwa man regarding the capacity of stones and other apparently inanimate objects to speak to humans. The Ojibwa man suggested that stones are grammatically animate. Confused, the anthrop anthropologist asked him, are all stones we see about us here alive? The Ojibwa man reflected for a long while and then replied, no, but some are. Native philosophers such as Vine Deloria, Brian Yazzie Burkhart, and others would not necessarily interpret this insertion to mean that the old man had actually spoken to a stone before, 
but rather that he would not close off the possibility that he could learn something from interacting with the stone. According to Adam Erla, if we approach the stone as an inanimate object in advance, assuming that it is nothing but a mute object that sits in front of us at our disposal to use as we will, we will never encounter a stone as anything more than a mute object. In indigenous thought broadly conceived, things are always already not mute objects at our disposal to use as we will, but are intricately active and related. Viola Cordova, um, an indigenous philosopher, attempts to unpack the indigenous concept of all things are related, which you hear a lot in, in indigenous philosophy, um, through this analogy, which I really like, and it's not what people would often first go to. So I suppose one could use the analogy of a stone thrown into the pond. Each thing, stone, air, molecule, plant, animal, or vegetable, causes a ripple to form in that pond. This singular particular being is not merely itself tossed into the pond. It is also the ripple, the wave that is formed by our action. Our waves overlap and extend beyond what we can foresee. So it's not just the usual metaphor of you throw a stone in and look, there's effects. It's that, but it's also all the things that happen to get the stone to go into the water in the first place. So there's both ends of that equation. Vine Deloria echoes this notion of relationality, saying that everything in the natural world has relationships with every other thing and a total set of relationships that make up the world as we experience it. Additionally, Deloria argues that the world is constantly creating itself because everything is alive and making choices that determine the future. For Deloria then, who kind of does a nice, maybe overly simplistic, but I find it useful, um, premises that hold true for most indigenous thought, at least in North America. Um, these four premises are everything is alive, or all things are alive, everything is related, all relationships are historical, and space and time determine the nature of relationships. A story. It's a sunny, crisp September afternoon when I meet with Lori, the Natural Resources Director of the Kuina Bay Indian Community, in her office overlooking Kuina Bay on Lake Superior. I've come here to learn about wild rice harvesting. Lori shares a bit with me about the tribe's efforts to preserve and reintroduce wild rice. She then describes the process her family undergoes when wild ricing. She describes how everyone, her family, and folks from the tribe get together when the paddy is near ready to start making everything they need for that harvest, including push poles to push the canoe through a paddy. Um, an oar would destroy the rice. A winnowing birch bark basket to remove the hulls from the rice and the knockers. She describes going into the paddy with her son, pushing their canoe through the wild rice, knocking the rice into the canoe floor, and returning to the shore to begin the long process of preparing the rice for storage or use. You dry the rice on a tarp for at least two days, parch the rice over a fire, dance on the rice in a hole in the ground to break the hulls, and then winnow the rice in birch bark baskets. This process is a communal one and can take up to a week. People camp at the lake, feast, enjoy each other's company, and harvest the rice as their ancestors did. There are, as she admits, shortcuts, machines that will do this work, but it's not the same. She says you lose the community, you lose the connection to your land and your people. Although she admits it's a heck of a lot easier. Winona LeDuc, in describing wild rice traditions of the white earth Anishinaabe of northern Minnesota, recounts that in 1900, Anthropologist Albert Jenks wrote with disdain about traditional wild rice gathering practices, saying, the primitive Indians do not take production very seriously. In the case of wild rice, they could gather more if they did not spend so much time feasting and dancing every day and night during the time they are here for the purposes of gathering. This slowness and care, however, is very serious. It respects the culture, it respects the rice, it respects the relations that exist before one enters the context for the purposes of gathering and repurposing. This respect for the always already, often unknowable relations between objects exemplifies the Ojibwe conception of Ayan Guamatin, the title of my talk and I hope to take away of my suggestion of how cultural rhetoric can inform digital rhetoric Note, I'm not talking about digital rhetoric specifically here, and I hope you might make some of those connections for yourself. Ion Guamazin literally translates as be careful or take care, but understood in this term as a whole worldview having to do with our place in the universe. Tread carefully might be more accurate, 
Um, as the Ojibwe tradition understands the character of things as happenings, the language itself is a verb-based language. Um, so things are always happenings. Things described by what they do or how they relate, not what a thing is. To consider the place of Ayan Guamazin in digital rhetoric, I want to return to Scott Lyons, um, who's also a Jibba from Northern Minnesota, often misappropriated work on rhetorical sovereignty. Lyons 2000 C's piece leads with the question, what do American Indians want from writing? His answer is rhetorical sovereignty. That is the inherent right and ability of peoples to determine their own communicative needs and desires in this pursuit to decide for themselves the goals, modes, styles, and languages of public discourse. In composition studies, particularly multimodal work, this concept is, uh, is often misused to suggest an individual instead of a collective sense of agency. That is, I see this quote used a lot to say, let the kids do whatever they want, let them use their modes, um, rhetorical sovereignty. But that's entirely missing two of Lyon's key points. First, Lyon's definition of rhetorical sovereignty specifies that it is the inherent right of peoples, plural. Second, Lyon's acknowledges that rhetorical sovereignty works to revive a people's possibilities and continuance. In describing sovereignty as it relates to Indian nations, Lyon suggests that the sovereignty of individuals and the privileging of procedure are less important than the logic of a nation people, which takes as its supreme charge the sovereignty of the group through a privileging of its traditions, culture, and continuancy. That is, an individual's communication acts gain importance as they are understood as furthering and positively transforming and sustaining a group's culture. He returns to this act of culturing in his 2010 book, X Marks. Um, and what he does here, I'm gonna kind of skip through this, but he's talking about the sense of culturing, and that is that people produce texts, and it's an ethical obligation of writers to produce texts that forward the culture, that support the culture, that push the people forward in new ways. So I suggest that by holding peoples and culturing along,side the idea I Ayang Guamazin, when conceptualizing digital rhetoric and the gathering that goes into that practice, we come to a richer understanding of both purpose and audience and the ways in which we make and compose digital texts. As such, a leading question when one engages with digital making should be, why and for whom does this benefit? Um, Lyons argues for him, it is always the we, not the I, that concerns him most. So as a rhetor engaging in digital rhetoric where assets are gathered for the sake of making, we're collecting our video clips, our sound clips, our images, our designs, Indigenous rhetoric encourage a encourages a pedagogical and personal stance that rejects being caught up in the eye, rejects the new, cool, zoomy thing one can make out of pre-existing objects, previous relations be damned, and instead embraces the we, always questioning who and what the next new, cool thing benefits. In considering the making of digital texts and the effects we intend to have them in the world, the second part of Lyon's definition of rhetorical sovereignty becomes increasingly important. And this part's like never cited in composition studies. They just cite that definition. Um, so here's the second part. He says, for indigenous people everywhere, sovereignty is an ideal principle, the beacon by which we seek paths to agency and power and community renewal. Attacks on sovereignty are attacks on what it enables us to pursue. The pursuit of sovereignty is an attempt to revive not our past, but our possibilities. Here, Lyons suggests the possible as an outcome of communication, which resonates nicely, um, I think, with Pulakis's definition of rhetoric and art, which seeks to capture in opportune moments that which is appropriate and that which is possible. So understood through the lens of rhetorical sovereignty and Ayan Guamazin, digital rhetorical production necessarily includes a sense of culture ring, one that is done for the we, one that suggests a way of moving forward, of producing more culture, more life, one that sees our available designs and semiotic resources not as static objects waiting for us to bring them to life. One that reminds us that the world is not full of concepts just waiting to be plucked from their context. When teaching, defining, and embodying a digital rhetoric, our objective should be to create in such a way as to open up new worlds of possibilities, new futures, in response to a confrontation with problems that we presently lack the resources to resolve. However, we must make sure that in doing so, we are cautious that our employment of and engagement with the world 
does not unconsciously repeat and reinforce the world from which we are attempting to find lines of flight. This requires attention and attentiveness, not just to individual rhetorical assets, but an honoring of the neighborhoods they inhabit with or without us. Let us take our digital rhetorical practices very seriously by allowing for the feast, the dance, the time, the honoring, and the recognition that our rhetorical acts emerge and make meaning through the constant act of relating. Miigwech. Thanks.